all data. Praise the Lord. This is something that I want to talk to us about as Christians and give us an understanding in, again, you, you're not going to make it as a Christian if you don't pray. It's just, it's an impossibility. It's, it's, you, I, well, I had the privilege of teaching the men in college a few years back and I believe the Lord gave me something to say to them and it was just something in the college that they use it as a motto now. And, the, and it was this, if you ain't praying, you ain't staying. And brothers, the, the, uh, unfortunately, sisters, unfortunately, if you're somebody who has a weak prayer life, you have a weak Christianity. You can determine someone's Christianity by the way they pray. If they don't pray, if there's a non-existent prayer life, you're a non-existent Christian. You're fodder for the enemy. Because we are taught to, to overcome. There are times when the Lord allows for our weakness, but there are times that the Lord encourages to, to march on. When Jesus taught the disciples, he taught the disciples to pray. The Bible says that this, this let, let's read it. Uh, verse 9, it says, Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows all things. Uh, I will repent one day and wear glasses, but as for yet, I'm going to put the Bible on my nose. Therefore do not be like them, for your, for your Father knows the things that you have need for, for before you ask. Him. And then he teaches them how to pray. In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father... In heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Who can quote that? Who can remember reading that? As a child at school, used to read that. So Jesus taught them how to pray. So his disciples ask us, teach us how to pray, and then he gets this out, and this is what he says, our Father who art in heaven. It's knowing where you're praying and how holy God is. It's praying to a holy God. You're not praying to somebody that you can be, I suppose there is sometimes that you can have a quick time of prayer, but it's bringing your mind into a recognising that you're praying to our heavenly Father, who's a holy and righteous God talks here about that you'd, we'd pray that your kingdom come and your will be done. I like that because I ain't in that part. Because many of us pray that the opposite way, don't we? Lord, my will, what I want. There's no me in this. It's Lord, what you want and let your will be done. So we can pray that. Lord, have your way, Lord. Do your work. Give us our daily bread. Our daily bread, if you like. Well, i quite oftenly pray that. I do ask the Lord to meet me needs when I go out to work. Lord, you provide for us. And how often should you do that? Well, this was a daily prayer. This was give us our daily bread. So we didn't pray this once a month or once a fortnight or once in need. It was asking the Lord to to provide for us. That was a daily routine that he taught them how to pray. Um, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He taught us how to pray that. We do that. We take the Lord's table. We ask the Lord in this area. Um, lead us not into temptation we can ask the Lord for that but I struggle to find and in my own Christianity this next part was something that I find many Christians don't do or didn't or wasn't aware of he said um, lead us into ne- not temptation but deliver us from the evil one deliver us from the evil one how many of you genuinely honestly even put that into a train of thought that you would say Lord, keep me from the evil one this day. Keep me away from evil this day. So when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, praying against the evil one, the schemes, the temptation, and praying against, do not let me be led by the evil one, was a part of a prayer. It was something that they had to do as a prayer routine, if you like. You can pray for your needs. No harm. You pray to the Heavenly Father. You ask him. You can ask him. You can ask the Lord. But there has to be a portion of your prayer. This is what he taught us. A prayer against the schemes of the enemy. I want to tell you that when Jesus taught them how to pray, he taught them how to be specific in prayer. In John 17, when you read Jesus' own prayer, Jesus prayed specifically. 
we can become so lapsadaisical in our prayer life, like we're praying a shopping list. You've heard that? Well, yeah, yeah. Oh, Jesus, please. And over. We ain't told to pray that way. Jesus taught us how to be specific in our prayer. Talk about having, save me grandchildren, Lord. Save them, Lord. Lord, don't just save them. Let them grow up knowing you. Let them, let them go to the right schools, Lord. Let them have a conscious thought of what you're praying for when you're praying it. Not just a random ask. Save them. And that's it. But be in Pacific in your prayers. And when Jesus taught them how to pray, he taught them that little list. This is how you should pray. Here's the list. Here's a little out guide. There's a little line. Pray against the evil one. If we're talking about spiritual warfare, he talked about let's do the will of the Lord. He talked about our needs. But he tells us that we should take a portion of our prayer life and pray against the schemes of the evil one. Who's failed in that? Who forgot that even existed? John 17, read the Lord's Prayer. Jesus prayed against the evil one. John 1 John chapter 4 says the whole world is under the sway or the influence of the evil one. It's reality. It's a real, this whole world is under the sway of the evil one. And come on, we're not that blind to say that we can't see it. We can. We're not that blind to say, right, this is coming. And do you not think that what's going on in the world today won't attack our people? You, you, do you not think that what's going on in their schools and what's being taught, it's only going to be a little while before it's into our, our, our lot of people, if you like. And if we don't think that that's happening, then I'm afraid to say we're wrong. We need to put our minds back onto the things of the Lord and pray against these things. Bible teaches us that when Jesus taught us how to pray, he taught us to be specific in our prayer life. I can't tell you, I can't make you understand the importance of specific prayer in your life. I can't make you understand it. But I can urge you and encourage you to do it. And I've got to tell you that when you've had a month or a time where you've been specific in your prayer and you see what works and what changes in you. I know I don't look like a man that fasts. I know, I know I don't look like a man, I've probably missed a quite a few. But I do take one day a week, and I've done for a number of years, where I take one day a week, specifically me and my wife, we will have a day where we pray and fast, where we seek the Lord's face. I can tell you that, and I can encourage you to do it. Brothers and sisters, it really makes a difference. It does, doesn't it? If you do it, I'll ask everybody here, when was the last time you prayed and fast? I'm not talking about a church event. I'm happy for the church events. I like them. We do, should do more of them. But you yourself, when was it? I'll tell you when you've done it. Do you know when the situation called for it? Something was really going on. Some operation, something was going on. You really got on your hands and knees and you really had that time of prayer. You had a time of prayer and fast where you got met with the Lord. Don't wait for that opportunity. It's a missed opportunity when you're waiting for them times to come before you really get the grips with the Lord. It's, in fact, it's, it's, it's putting on your armour back to front. That's what that is. When it talks about our weapons of warfare, like I preached in the last session, or talk in 2 Corinthians, it's mighty. Warfare is mighty. When Christians don't pray, it's just the enemy just takes over. There's nothing, we're not coming against him. We're taught to come against him. We're taught in his word. Jesus would pray a prayer against the evil one. He would teach us to pray against the evil one. And brothers and sisters, we're fooled if we're not praying against him too. There is a spirit that goes on in this world. And the spirit of of all the, the wickedness of this world. And we are told to come against it. We are told to do that. Do you know Christians can make a change to the whole world? Christians can make a change. Can you imagine how dark it would be in this world when all the Christians are not here no more? How dark would the world be if there was no churches? How dark would it get? Come on, let's, let's be honest. How, how horrible would it get? It's frightening. I don't think I'd want to live in a world where there's no Christianity or there's no churches. No place that you could go and worship the Lord. Don't want to live in that world. But sometimes we live a comfortable Christianity where some of us like to be spoon fed. We do. I like to go and listen to teachings and like somebody to feed me and teach me nice things without studying the word of God for myself. 
And I can stand here and teach you about, teach the word of God, Stephen, and teach the word of God. The other ministers here teach the word of God. But one thing we can't do, we can't pray for you. Now, we can pray for the sick. I don't mean that. Someone's sick, we can pray. <coughs> but we can't physically get in your home, shut the door, and physically make you have a time of prayer. That's down to you. And surely that's relationship. Surely that is what Christianity is. Everything else, the religious people have got. But a right relationship is what we're told to have. So in that right relationship, we are told to have specific prayers. Pray for certain situations. And sometimes I think that we lack as Christians. We lack in areas. We see things that come in in Christians' life. Have you ever seen an older Christian fall at an hurdle and you think, well, I thought he'd, I thought he'd have knew better than that. Well, I can tell you where he went wrong. He ain't praying. That's it. And it is as simple as that. Now, when we turn to 2 Corinthians, uh, sorry, Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about, therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Having done all, stand. It talks about how we are to stand. And we are to stand firm. And having after, after all, we are to, to stand in the evil day. Verse 14, it says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with the truth, having put the, the breastplate of righteousness. Would you stop there for a second in that? It talks about Christians girding themselves with the belt or the buckle of truth. Again, I'll make this statement. This is the attitude of a Christian. You cannot be a lying Christian, you know. It, it don't work. I'm a lying Christian. I tell lies. I lie about everything, really. That's no, you're going to get found out. It's no testimony. You're got, it's not going to work. Christians, this is the attitude that a Christian should be in. I put the buckle of truth in. You know what that means? You don't want to wake up in the morning, I tell the truth. I tell others the truth. I, when I hawk, I hawk the truth. When I, whatever I go to work in, it's the truth. I don't lie now. I no longer lie. I tell the truth. This is a Christian character, a Christian attitude. Why? Why do you have to tell the truth? Well, do you not think you could, the enemy could catch you out on that lie? Do you not think that the enemy could quite easily catch you out and cause problems for you because you've lied? Do you not think that? And as Christians, the attitude is the truth. The, the, the breastplate of righteousness, that's something that Christ gives me. His righteousness. I'm allowed to put that on because he's given that to me. I can't take that off. It's his righteousness. Having your shoes, having, you, having shod your feet with the preparation for the gospel of peace. Brothers and sisters, the gospel that we bring to a fallen world is the gospel of peace. It's the, what a gospel message. It's the gospel of peace in a dark and fallen world. When everything's upside down, we teach peace. The gospel of peace. Come to Jesus. Come to the Lord. Salvation is the greatest thing ever given to us. And having your feet shod to where your feet's going, where your feet is being led, is the places to tell people the gospel of peace. That's what it is. Above all, taking up the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, again, evil one, wicked one, however you want to put that. The shield of faith. How do we overcome uh, all the fiery darts of the enemy? As we take up the shield of faith. We stand up under faith. There might be war going on. There might be trouble. There might be things that's happening. But we take faith. We hold faith. We say, Lord, I put my faith and my trust in you. All these schemes, all these things that the enemy brings against me. Lord, I'm standing on truth. I've got my feet ready for the gospel. I've got your righteousness. And you know what? Because I stand with this, I can hold up the shield of faith and say, you know what? I don't have to listen to the enemy. I don't have to listen to the the fear or the lies or anything that he might bring. We stand up under the shield of faith where we quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. And taking up the helmet of salvation... The helmet of salvation, that is the, the protection of our mind. And I like this. I like the idea that the helmet of salvation is something that I can... That if I can't, you can't see it, but I'm wearing it. I've got the helmet of salvation. It's on. 
I mean, I'm, I'm, my mind is his, I'm his. He saved me, he's done a work in me, I belong to him. He's, he's doing a work with my mind, again, it's that renewing of our mind, that we are new creations, that helmet of salvation that's on my head. I am his now. And taking up uh, and taking the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Again, it's one of these things, you hold up the shield of faith, the sword is something that you battle with, it's having an understanding of God's word. Well, her sister asked me a good question. She said, when Peter heard from God and then he heard from Satan, how did he distinguish? How did he know? How didn't he know the difference in the voice? How do we know the difference in the voices? Because God always backs up what he tells me through his word. He never goes against his word. The more that I can have an understanding of this. And when you see where Satan come against Jesus, when he quoted scripture, Jesus would just went... That's the lie. This is the truth. This is this. This is that. He understood the word of God. When you take it all the way back to that garden, did God really say it was the distinction, that twisting of God's word? And when they didn't know God's word or it got twisted, they fell. And here it says that we are to take up the sword of faith or the, the, sorry, the, the, the word of God, that sword that we take and that we are to have an understanding of it. And I'll say this, that a sword was something that the Roman soldiers, they were skilled at using. They had to train them. This is the sword. This is how you go to fight. This is the battle that you, this is the battle that you, you, you wage with it. This is how you fight with it. And the, the Roman Empire conquered the known world just with a small sword because it taught its army how to use that sword. Brothers and sisters, we are taught that we should know the word of God, have an understanding of the word of God. And I want to say this, not to have another man's opinion all the time of the word of God, but have your own, have your own relationship with the word of God. Have your own understanding with the word of God. Your pastors are here to guide you and lead you, but surely you want your church to read the word of God and have an understanding for themselves. I do. I don't want my congregation to be constantly spoon-fed, all they're getting. And I want to just warn every person here, not every teaching that you hear on the internet is a good teaching. It can be foolishness, it can be wrong. We have to have an understanding so that we know what's right, we know what's the truth. Praying always with all prayers and supplications in the spirit, being watchful to the end with all perseverance, supplication for all the saints. It goes on here with the armour of God and then it talks about prayer. Prayer is something, brothers and sisters, that is, it's something so spiritual. It is something that is so powerful. Placed into the right hands, revival starts with prayer. Think about that. Think about that. I think it was D.L. Moody asked Gypsy Smith, who was a revival preacher, and he said to him, how do we start a revival? How would, how would, what's your advice to us to get a revival started? And that's what D.L. Moody asked. And Gypsy Smith said to him, I'll tell you what to do. Go home, go into a room, draw a circle. Stand in the circle and say, Lord, put a revival in. Start a revival inside this circle. Do a work in me so that others might come and see the work. Do a work in me that I might lead others to you. Prayer is such an importance, it is such a, 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 a battle, it is such something that we need as Christians that when we don't do it, we're weak, we fall. And prayer is such an important thing that it can change pathways, it can change lives. What changes from someone to being a drunkard to being set free one minute? How does that work? Can you tell me how that works? Can you, have you got the definite to say, well, I'll tell you what happens. You haven't. But it was one prayer that did it. One prayer that did it. I don't know why all prayers don't get answered. I don't, I don't have the answer for that. But I know that God has the answers for that. I do know as Christians that face, that live in a real world and a, with a real enemy. And that as Christians we need to be able to overcome all the schemes of the enemy. Overcome all the wells of the devil. How to overcome? It's done in prayer. It's done with a right understanding, with a right prayer life. It's done that. Sometimes we fall in the pattern of just not having a prayer life, just having a, a quick 
microwave time of prayer with the Lord and expecting great things. And I think, and I thank God that he's been gracious to us. I thank God that he has helped us along, that he has stood in the gap with us, if you like, and he's helped pull us along. I'm going to answer that. But there has to come a time when we grow up and you can understand somebody, the age of their Christianity by what they pray. They can pray in this church and you can understand where they're at in their prayer life. You can. Because if it's all me, Lord, help me, Lord, do this with me, you can understand it. When, when we grow up in their prayer life, is Lord, where would you take me? Where would you have me? Where do you want me to be? Who do you want me to talk to? Sometimes we treat God like, we're going somewhere, Lord, why don't you come with us? When it should be, it's the other way around. When we're taught how to do the Lord's will, it's the other way around. It's, Lord, your will, where would you have me? Involve me in what you're doing this day, Lord. Involve me in it. We talk about spiritual warfare. And I don't want to make this like, uh, or I didn't want to make this. I can talk about things that have gone on. I have been in the process, I've been in places when I've seen demon-possessed people set free. I have been there and I have seen them things. And I want to tell you something, the Lord is real. And by, by the power of prayer, people do get set free. But that's not the important thing for us today. The importance is to understand that our day-to-day life is a spiritual warfare. Not ghostbusters. We're not here talking about demon slayers. That's foolishness to us. We can deal with that. That comes across us. We're ready to deal with that. But don't think that you're going to say a quick 10-minute prayer, put yourself right, and going to go and deal with that. That starts like David. David was able to withstand Goliath because he fought a lion. We're able to withstand all the schemes of the enemy, face the darkest of times, because we, we know what it's like to have a prayer life. We know what it's like to trust in the Lord. We know what it's like to pray of a morning, to have days of prayer and fast. We know what it's like to have a right relationship with the Lord. We know what that's like. Our weapons of warfare for tearing down strongholds, for being mighty. Do you know what I want to tell you something? I think it's been a trick of the enemy for too long. When Christians won't have a time of prayer or pray, for the, pray to the Lord in their own homes. You're only as strong as your prayer life. You're only going to go as far as what, the, what your prayer life determines really. That's it. There are probably men and women in here. Men and women in here that can go one week to the next week without praying to the Lord. Surely that would be shameful. If we could see it, see everybody's time spent with the Lord this week. And we wore it like numbers on the top of her head. I wonder what would win. I wonder what would be there. Lapsodaisical Christianity causes people to fall. Not in the fight, not in a battle. Don't realise that they're in a fight and they're in a battle. Don't realise it. And brothers and sisters, we are. We are. When, we, when Jesus taught us how to pray, it wasn't a gimmick. It wasn't, oh, look, when you get the chance, have a time of prayer, this is what to say. He taught us in a way, this is what you pray, now be specific in your prayer life. Pray this, be specific. Ask the Lord, bring it to before the Lord, be specific in your prayer life. Think about every other religion in this world. They set up a routine time for prayer. And I think it's shameful to think that a Muslim would pray to a dead God in a dead religion more than Christians pray to a living God in a living religion. I said the word religion, but it is a new religion, isn't it? <laughs> Do you understand? Do you understand? There is a warfare. There is. There are people that face darkness. But that darkness is overcome by prayer. Hallelujah. Truly, truly Hallelujah. prayer. I know that we have churches that are under the attack of the enemy and they don't even know it. We have individuals that are under the attack of the enemy and don't even know it. And how do you overcome? How do you fight back? Sometimes we have the, like, apathy comes across us. Like, we can't be bothered. Can't be bothered to pray. Can't be bothered to do it. Well, you know what we're told to do with that? Go to war. Go to war. Kick back. Say, okay. 
Put everything down, switch the telly off. I think sometimes we're not quiet enough to allow the Lord to speak to us. Sometimes if we ain't listening to the telly or listening to the radio or listening to something or we're watching something, where the whole mind's consumed in entertainment fully all day long. Anybody else suffer with that? Entertainment fully. For the moment you open your eyes, it's entertainment. You've got to watch something, you've got to listen to something, be talking to somebody. Sometimes there's a quiet time that we need to spend with just us and the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we need to put that into our routine, our daily routine. You get up and have breakfast, don't you? Well, you get up. Well, I have breakfast. I don't miss many meals, but we get up and we, we, we set up our own routines, don't we? We do. Some of our sisters, you know, you've got children. I'll tell you what I find is a pity and a shame. Men in here teach their children how to go to work. We teach our children how to get up and go and earn a living. Women, you teach your girls to get up and how to clean. Shame on us because we've never taught them how to pray. And we take them into a deep, dark world and expect them to be Christians, innit? Christians who don't teach their children to pray. My God, it's a sad thing. We treat it as... We can, put, we can do what we want to do with them. Put nice watches on them. Put, give them nice things and nice motors. Teach them how to go on. But we don't teach them the word of God. We don't teach them how to pray. I want to tell you, shame on us. We've made mistakes. I've made them mistakes. Maybe we've got grandchildren we need to teach how to pray. Maybe we've got another generation. There are things that we can do. And our children, when they see the importance of it in their life, they want that importance in their life. Prayer is such an important thing for Christians. I find that it's probably the first thing to go when somebody's on their way out. When somebody's on their way out of Christianity, it's the first thing that leaves them. They no longer start to pray, no longer want it. Don't want to pray no more. And I find that the the enemy hinders us in our prayer life. The biggest part that he does, the enemy doesn't want us to pray against him. The enemy doesn't want us to pray at all. So we rather fall asleep, we're tired, or other things going on, the children start, things go on. We have to stop this and make time for the Lord. Make time. Every person here has the same 24 hours. I do, you do. I don't make more time than what you have. I ain't got a a secret where I've got more time than you. I haven't. Brothers and sisters, we need this. Our weapons of warfare... A mighty indeed for tearing down strongholds. Tearing down strongholds. You've got family that addic- uh, suffer with addiction? We can pray. We can bring that before the Lord. Now, before I go any further, have we got any questions on this? Got any questions? Questions about, I don't know, weapons of warfare? Anybody can add to this? In my experience, in my experience, I thought, I thought that I did not need prayer and fasting. I did not need, I thought I, I knew as a minister I needed to pray. But I'm telling you now, when I felt the enemy's attack in my life, I realised it was because I was a weak Christian in one area. And that was my prayer life. We want to make this physical. It will never be physical. Christianity will never, ever, ever be just physical. It will always be spiritual. You want to grow up in the things of the Lord? You want to grow up fast? You want to grow up and serve the Lord to the best of your ability? Why is this the hardest thing to do then? Why is this the hardest thing to do? Why is it hard? Maybe might have to start up prayer teams. Maybe you take a brother or sister here and say, right, after I drop the kids off at school, up past nine, I want to phone you up and we're going to have a time of prayer. We're going to have to, have, we're going to, have to do something. Something's got to change. If you're in this place and you're suffering in an area that you believe that, and you've suffered for years in it, you need to come back it, go to war, start to pray. If you have children that are suffering in areas... You know what you need to do? What's the answer? 
pray. Quite well, as simple as that. If I told somebody to do something supernatural, do do climb bed climb bed nevis, do this and then pray at the top. That's why the Catholic religion, when people go to roads and they, they think that they can earn something, it's not. How simple is it? How do you overcome the evil one? How do you overcome the evil one? Do you, have you learned that? Is that a lesson that you've learned? How do you overcome the evil one? It's a daily time of prayer and being specific in our prayer life. Being specific in our prayer. True prayer is specific prayer. And I can't explain that any better. When Jesus prayed, Jesus prayed against the evil one. Jesus was specific in prayer for me. He was specific in prayer for his disciples. When Jesus taught us how to pray, he taught us how to be specific in our prayer life. And then when I'm talking here today, I'm telling us as a church, it's worked in my life. Me being specific in my prayer, I've seen things that's going on in my life that stopped things that the Lord has delivered me from, things that the Lord has helped me in, things that the Lord has done a work in my life. And I'm a Christian for 20 odd year. And it's probably the, the last five years has probably been the best part of my Christianity. Why? Because the Lord has taught me something. In fact, it dragged me to a place by the top of my head with me screaming, saying, Lord, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. And then he's got me to a place and went, unless you pray, Charles, you're going to struggle with this the rest of your life. And I want to tell you, there is victory in Christ. There is victory. We can tear down strongholds. Brothers and sisters in here who suffer, suffer probably with... I don't know. Suffer with problems. Do you want to be able to overcome them? How much do you want to overcome them? How much do you want to overcome them? Let's get real. Let's start to have specific times of prayer. Let's seek the Lord on our own. Shut the door. Lord, come Lord. Let's, let's deal with this, Lord. It's a shame for the think the years that we've wasted. Isn't it? Sometimes we can waste years and years and years by going, oh, I heard that 20 years ago, you know. Well, what did you do about it? Well, I just thought, you know. We have, we have so much work to get involved with, so much work to do. I want to tell you that I'm all for going out witnessing. We go out witnessing in our church. We preach the gospel. I'm all for it. But I'm telling you, it's more effective with prayer than without I can try and get every person in here and give them a job for the convention. Right, you do this, you do that. Come, we're going to do the Lord. Serve the Lord. You've all got a job. You're working on the snack bar. You're out picking rubbish. You're helping me with the, with the sand equipment. You're all doing that. That's physical. I can make every person in here physical. But then I say to them, I want you to go home. I want you to shut your door. I want you to have a time of prayer and fast just between you and the Lord. And I want you to pray for the convention this year. People are like... Yeah. What's the most important in that? We can make 20 people physical, but can't get, any, can't get one spiritual. And there's a, there's a struggle there. And sometimes we don't realise it. The spiritual warfare that we, felt that we fight is that we are spiritual beings. He's put his spirit inside of us. We are, we are spiritual beings. We've been made alive in Christ. And now it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by his spirit. And he teaches us to be spiritual beings. Pray, seek the Lord, seek the Lord while he might be found. Why is my countenance so down within me? And then when I seek the Lord, he lifted me up on high. When you read all the psalmists, when you read all the poetry there, wouldn't they not prayers that people prayed? They hit the floor, realised where they was wrong and lifted their self through prayer. I like it when people, brothers and sisters in our church, they come forward and say, would you pray for the Lord to strengthen me? And I go, I, oh, I'm going to pray, but oh, I have faith that the Lord can do it. But let me just tell you how you get strength. Go home and start to have a relationship with the Lord. Go home and start to pray yourself. Come and put strength into yourself. Put fire into your own bones. Put fire into your own self. How do you do it? Have a right relationship. Start to pray with the Lord. Start to bring things to the Lord to mind. Deliver me from this, Lord. Take this away from me, family, Lord. I know, I know some people wanted something different from this meeting. But you don't realise how much of the spiritual warfare is going on here today. 
How many of you's a mind are just drifting and think, I've heard it all before? And you walk out the door and do exactly the same as you did yesterday. No amount of preaching. And there are plenty of better preachers than me. Plenty. And you want somebody to come scream and shout and give you all goosebumps. Goosebumps is a sign of authority, isn't it? Goosebumps is a sign of the spirit working. No, I'm afraid not. Right understanding with the right fault, with the right word of God, speaking to people's lives. And if this don't change you, what will? What will? Come on, we're at war. The battle's here, but we can win. We can win. Overcome, let's overcome. And if there's anybody in here, and we're going to have a time of prayer in a minute, but I want to, I want to just say if there's anybody here who is struggling, and I don't want people to come out and I'll make a list of things and say, yeah, um, oh, look, did you see her? She's suffering, she's suffering in that area. Or he's suffering. What's the point? We're brothers and sisters here. We just encourage one. I need prayer. I do. I generally need prayer. I need my brothers and sisters to pray for me. Before I got behind this pulpit today, I asked my church to pray for me. Church, would you pray? This is my, my prayer to my church. Church, would you pray for me? I'm going to another church. I'm teaching now. I need your prayers, church. Please pray for me. I need that. I need your prayers. You need mine. What an army we've got in here. What a what lot of warriors. What? We're putting army on, not infants, not babes, but we're putting ar- uh, armour on soldiers. Let's get to war. Let's not be a sleeping church, but a one at war. Taking ground, taking the enemy's ground. Do you know when it says that... Um, uh, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not propel against it. And yes, it is the wisdom of hell is not going to propel against it, if you like. But where did they build it? At the gates of hell. What you got to do? What has Satan got to do with us? Only the ground that we give him. Only the ground that we give him. Only the fear that we allow him to put in our lives. Only the things that we allow the enemy. Bring it before the Lord and say, Lord, teach me how to overcome this. Lord, put in me that right spirit. Let fear leave. Let anxiety, let worry, let stress. Let it all go, Lord. Let me seek you. Let me stand in the beauty of your holiness and just worship you, Lord, because you're it. It's all about you. How do we overcome? Seeking the Lord. Prayer. Struggles that you have. Can be defeated today. Today. Not tomorrow. Today. How do you do it? Come on. Prayer. How simple is that? How simple is that? Well, let's do it then. Let's pray.